Here's an introduction to stellar energy transport to accompany chapter 16 of the textbook Astronomy from OpenStax. So when we're talking about heat transport, there are three main ways to do this, just in general. So conduction is one way, and this is basically when you have uh, molecular vibrations or electrons being transferred. And this is what's transferring heat from one region to another. So for instance, if these spheres here represent molecules in a, in a lattice, so if you have some kind of crystalline-like structure, then you can have kind of density waves sort of propagate through. So these molecules are rattling around and they're really close together. And then this molecule, for instance, will kind of move a little bit in a wave, knock that one and knock that one. And no one molecule is moving that far, but in general, they're kind of propagating, you know, kind of like kind of like a wave does. And uh, that's one way you can transport heat or electrons can basically be passed from one atom to another. And that is another way that uh, you can have conduction. We're not gonna talk much more about this because this isn't relevant for most stars that we're considering in this class. Um, this is really more relevant for white dwarf and uh, stars and neutron stars, which are very dense stellar remnants that we'll touch on later, but we're not gonna cover in a lot of detail. So convection, this uh, you're probably very familiar with. This is basically like a bulk fluid motion. And what you have is you have a hot bubble, uh, then expands and rises. It cools off and is dumped back down. This happens all the time in Earth's atmosphere. This happens when you boil water on the stove. Um, so you, you see this all the time. And it's, it's very relevant for the stars that we're considering in this class. And as we'll see, you know, how relevant it is for a given star depends on the conditions a little bit. And we'll go over that in just a moment. Uh, radiation, this is cooling by emitting photons. So for instance, when something's uh, heated up like a bar of iron to a very high temperature and you see it glow, it's cooling off by emitting those photons, in this case, you know, yellow to, to red photons uh, for the most part. But in general, it's gonna be a black body spectrum that we uh, talked about in earlier lectures on light. And again, like convection, this is relevant for, for most stars, but the uh, extent in the star is gonna depend on the details a little bit. So let's talk a little bit more about radiation. So in the sun's core, you know, let's say you have, you have nuclear reactions powering the core of the sun, as we talked about in an earlier lecture and the neutrinos stream straight out. So those come straight to the Earth. But the photons, they don't stream straight out. They're, they undergo lots and lots of interactions. So a given photon, when it's created, it can be scattered, absorbed, or emitted. Um, so it can, it can wind up being basically kind of captured. And then that energy can be put into an atom, for instance, to excite electrons, and then re-emitted. Now, what's emitted or what's scattered is technically a new photon. It's not really the same photon anymore. But when, when I say that a photon is, is traveling out of the sun, we really mean that the energy that corresponded to that original photon, that is what is being transported outwards. So ultimately what the photon does is that it, when it undergoes any given interaction, it can go any, any direction, really. Um, for the most part. So it can scatter and it can go a little bit left and a little bit right. And if you follow thousands of these paths, then eventually some kind of distance will have been covered. So though you're moving in a random direction, you know, eventually you can random walk your way out of uh, the star. And so basically after lots and lots of random steps, you can cover some distance and that's what our photon is doing. So for, the, for a photon, in the sun or in a star that comes from the core and is going out to the stellar radius, you need some large number of steps. And um, the number of steps you need is basically the square root of that times this thing called L, which is the mean free path. And th this mean free path, it may sound confusing, but mean means average. Free means how far, you know, when it's not interacting and path is just the length. So literally this is how far a photon can go before it is absorbed um, or scattered, before it undergoes some interaction. And if we look at the solar core, 
then the mean free path is actually very short. It's on average, it's, it's, um, it's only something like, you know, uh, less than a millimeter. And so we can do, what we can do is then take this mean free path, this L, we can calculate the distance we need to cover um, and plug in our mean free path here. And what we see is that this thing called the photon diffusion time, it's the distance that you travel. So that's the number of steps times the length of one step divided by the speed that the photon is moving. So that's the speed of light. We can plug in our relationship over here relating the um, number of steps that we take to the radius, plug that in. And we see that the photon diffusion time is the radius of r star squared divided by this mean free path times the speed of light. And for the example of the sun, it takes about 200,000 years for the energy of a photon created in the core to make it out to the surface. So that, that photon you know, takes hundreds of thousands of years to make its way out from the core to the, to the surface. And then it takes only about eight minutes to travel to us at the Earth. Now the actual radiation transport is really sensitive to details, and it all boils down to this, that mean free path that we're talking about, how far you can travel until a photon is scattered. And that's gonna depend on the composition of your star's atmosphere, and the temperature and the density. So if we look at the sun, what we're plotting here is the abundance as a function of the proton number. So this tells you the element. And you can see the sun is mostly hydrogen and helium. And then there's lots of other little stuff here. This vertical direction is actually a log scale. So you, know, you have 92% hydrogen, but down here, this is only 0.1% oxygen. And then there's a mixture of a whole bunch of, of other stuff. Basically all the elements we find on Earth, we, we find in the sun as well. And so for any given star, we really need to know kind of this, this abundance distribution of the elements in the star if we wanna get the details of radiation transport exactly right. Um, and this, this mean free path also depends on the temperature and the density. And so this is just an example of this quantity here, uh, kappa rho is, is the opacity times the density. So we take a log of that. Um, this, this kappa times rho is one over our mean free path. We can look at this for any given um, uh, photon here uh, of a given wavelength, and you see that it depends a lot on the photon wavelength even. So you can have these sharp spikes here where your mean free path goes to nothing, and that's due to atomic transitions, and these all depend on the composition of your star. You don't need to know these, these details other than that you know, the, the mean free path is gonna depend on the composition, temperature, and density. The main point here is that it depends on these things and it can get complicated. And so if we take a look at a calculation of the sun, the vertical direction on this graph is the mean free path. The horizontal direction is the radius. So from the core out to the surface, and you can see that this mean free path starts out very small, but does some kind of complicated wiggles and this depends on your uh, temperature and density profile of the, the sun. So another way that we can transport heat is convection. And this is just bulk fluid motion. So what uh, happens is you have a hot blob of material. That blob of material then uh, will expand a little bit, which will allow it to rise because it's expanding. It's going to be less dense than the environment. If it can't efficiently cool off via radiation, it's gonna to continue to rise until finally it comes into thermal equilibrium with the surrounding environment. So it cools down. That heat that was in that blob of material gets dumped into the surrounding environment. So now it's cool and dense again, and because it's dense, it will sink. And it goes back down here, and that process can repeat over and over again. And the, the net result is that you have a lot of heat coming from the bottom here near the core of our star and that heat gets transported outwards and it turns out this is a very efficient way to, to transport heat or, or or rather when you have a lot of heat to dump you're going to wind up dumping it with uh, convection um, so in the sun this this one cycle here takes quite a while it takes about a week for our blob to make its its uh, round trip but you can have other more exotic environments like this thing called a neutron star, um, which is about the mass of the sun, but the size of a city. 
uh, on the surface, material can be dumped from a companion star that winds up creating this thing called an X-ray burst. It's an explosion on the surface. And here, convection time scales are more like 10 milliseconds. So you see this region gets hot. It gets hot enough that convection starts to happen. And then you're looking at these blobs forming, and it's it's extremely rapid process in this case. As far as the importance of convection in stars, um, and also the importance of radiation, radiative heat transport, it depends on the star itself. So you should really think about pausing this video and taking a minute to trying to understand this plot. It's a, it's a beautiful plot, but it is a little bit complicated. So what we have here is the vertical direction. This is basically the radial dimension of a star. It's given in mass coordinate. <laughs> um, so how much mass compared to the total mass of the star is enclosed. But essentially, as you go further up on the plot, you're moving to higher and higher radii. The uh, horizontal direction, this tells you the mass of the star that we're considering. So it's in a log scale, so zero is the sun itself. Uh, moving to the right of this red line are more massive stars. Moving to the, the left are stars that are less massive than the sun. So then what you do is you, for a given slice, a vertical slice, you're looking at one star, and these, these uh, cloud puffs here, this tells you where there's convection. So for instance, if I take this star here that's less massive than the sun, there's a lot of convection out in the uh, envelope, so out in the outer extent of the star, and then its radiative heat transport dominates in the core. If we go more massive than the sun, it's the opposite. We have a lot of convection in the core, and then the envelope, the outer extent, this has a lot of radiative heat transport. Um, if you take a look at the sun, there's a little convective envelope, basically, in terms of mass coordinate um, for our sun. It's kind of the boundary between high mass and uh, low mass stars. That's not an accident. That's because it's at the boundary of um, uh, PP chain and CNO cycle burning, like we saw in the introduction to stellar nuclear power lecture. That basically winds up being the reason why it's this boundary between high and low mass stars and, and why just above you have, a, for a little bit more mass, you have a convective core, and a little bit below, you have a convective envelope. So how do we know all this about the structure of the sun and about stars in general? Because um, it, it's right, it's a complicated thing. You can't fly a spacecraft into the sun. It would, it would melt before it even got close. Well, so we use different uh, signatures from, from the sun. So one uh, signature is the neutrinos, talked about this in the stellar nuclear power lecture. Another is we can get the composition of the sun from spectroscopy of the surface that we've talked about, for instance, in the introduction to spectra lecture. And we can also get composition from looking at meteorites in the solar system. So they, they come to Earth and we can measure their composition. Um, but another interesting tool that we have that's very powerful is this thing called helioseismology. So you may be familiar with seismology on Earth. That's where basically sound waves traveling through the Earth can be measured. And you can learn something about uh, the structure of the Earth. So geologists, for instance, can use earthquakes, take advantage of earthquakes to learn something about the structure of the Earth. How it works for the sun is um, spectroscopy is done. And you can use the spectroscopy, the shifting of spectral lines, the red shift and the blue shift, to see that part of the sun is moving inward or outward. So for instance, is the wavelength blue shifted? Is it coming towards us? Or is it red shifted? It's moving away from us. This is a simulation uh, of a star like the sun, where you see that you have this pattern of blue shift, red shift, blue shift, red shift. And these patterns are characteristic of the structure of the star itself. So the radial extent of convection, and the radial extent of radiative transport, those are going to wind up leaving an imprint in this helioseismological pattern. And so you can learn about the uh, density profile of the sun, for instance. That's shown here on this somewhat complicated plot. What you have is the difference between a modeled density of the star, of the sun rather, and the measured density of the sun uh, from helioseismology. So the vertical direction is the difference between the model and the helioseismological observation. 
the horizontal direction here, this is the radial extent of our sun. So the surface is one and the core is zero. And you can see that the models agree pretty well with, um, pretty well with the helioseismological observations. You, you do have um, differences up to, you know, 9% or so in some places. And this is, this is um, something called the solar modeling problem. That is an outstanding problem. But in general, the picture is, is pretty close. So we believe we do understand the structure of, uh, of our sun and, and other stars. So, you know, so far we've talked about the energy transport in stars in general, but what about the energy that we actually see? So the light that comes from the sun to us or any star to us, what, what are we actually seeing? Where's that light coming from? Um, that light comes from the photosphere. So our photon uh, is going to scatter just based on the mean free path and the radius of the sun. You can figure out that you have about, and the number of steps that it takes, you have about 10 to the 25 of these events, uh, these interactions. So I really should say scattering and, and absorption, uh, just interactions, 10 to the 25 on its way out of the sun. So you're not seeing the first photon that was produced. You're going to see instead the very last one, the, the last one that was produced after the last scatter or emission. So this is going to be, you know, one mean free path below the surface of your sun or of your star. If you consider the sun, the solar photosphere, this is about 100 kilometers from what you might call the surface. The surface is a little bit hard to define because it's a, it's a gas. And so there's like a density gradient there. But ballpark, we're talking 100 kilometers from the surface. That's the last photon you see. That may sound like a far distance, but it's only 0.01% towards the center. So you're really seeing the very surface of the sun. And there's an interesting phenomenon if you, you don't want to look at the sun so too long yourself, but if you film it with a camera that has a special filter that can, that can allow you to see that much light, um, or if you make a pinhole camera and you make an image of the sun, you'll see something like this. So all of the light that you see is from the photosphere, um, but you'll notice that it gets darker and darker as you go towards the edges of the, the sun. And that is not... Um, a trick of the eye or an issue with the camera or the, or the observations or anything like that, this, this is really a, a real thing. You, you see it get dimmer and dimmer as you get to the edge of the sun. And this is a phenomenon called limb darkening. And what's basically happening is that your photon, if you're looking at a photon right here from the center of the sun, it's just kind of coming straight out at you so that it just has to travel this one distance here. If you're looking at the edge of the sun, if we think of this, this last 100 kilometers as kind of a radial slice, we're not looking directly at it, we're kind of looking edge on. And so the photons are going to have to travel through more and more stuff as we're looking more and more edge on, and the brightness uh, reduces, and, and this is a real phenomenon then called, uh, that, that's called the limb darkening. And um, you can you can use it to study the sun, uh, for instance, by taking advantage of, of transits. This is part of the way that limb darkening has been measured. Um, Venus and Mercury pass in front of the sun, and we can observe that and um, mathematically quantify this limb darkening phenomenon, which is pretty cool. That is it for this introduction to stellar energy transport for Astronomy 1000.